For 50 years, the royalty of college football have filled this 72,000-seat stadium. It has been host to the legends of the sidelines. to eight Heisman Trophy winners and nine Outland Award winners. It has been the battleground of some curious questions, like who was that stranger who tackled Dickie Magel in 1954? Or did Alan Lowry's foot touch the out-of-bounds chalk mark in 1973? It is called the Cotton Bowl Classic, founded by the late J. Curtis Sanford. And it is here on New Year's Day that the Southwest Conference champion entertains a prestigious power, providing the nation with thrills and excitement second to none. With TCU's Sammy Baugh slinging the first touchdown pass thrown here, and Byron Wizard White, who would become a Supreme Court Justice, scoring the first defensive touchdown. The dream of a bowl game in Dallas became not only a reality, but a major attraction. In the 40s, many of America's most popular heroes lit up the Cotton Bowl Classic. SMU's Kyle Rode, famed number 37, Doak Walker, A&M's Jaron John Kimbrough, and Texas Bobby Lane wrote headlines in Dallas. The 50s brought the running of Jim Brown and the tackling of Tommy Lewis. Yes, it was Alabama's Lewis who fired off the bench to shock Rice's Magel, a play that was voted the most unusual sports happening of 1954. The 60s found the Cotton Bowl far ahead of the pack at deciding who was or was not number one. National champion Syracuse behind the magnificent running of All-America Ernie Davis solidified its crown with a 1960 triumph. During one of the few times ever that number one and number two clashed in a bowl, the top-ranked Texas Longhorns remain number one with a surprisingly easy win over Navy and Roger Staubach in 1964. In the 70s, Dallas became a home away from home for the Fighting Irish of Notre Dame and the Nittany Lions of Penn State. On the first day of 1970, Notre Dame broke tradition and appeared in a bowl game for the first time in 45 years. That bowl was the Cotton Bowl, and their opponent, the number one ranked Longhorns of Texas. James Street, who never lost a game in two years as UT quarterback, threw a fourth down pass to Cotton Spire, possibly the biggest play of the season. And a dramatic Cotton Bowl comeback brought a national championship to Daryl Royal's Longhorns. A year later, it was the ultimate struggle, part two. Texas had not lost in 30 games and was still ranked number one. But crafty Joe Theismann guided a splendid Irish attack that knocked the horns from a second straight national championship. Later in the decade, the Irish clinched another national title, upsetting number one Texas in the 1978 Classic. Matching Notre Dame's success in Dallas was that of Penn State. In 1972, the Lions shut down Texas, holding the horns without a touchdown for the first time in 80 games. Then in 74, Penn State spoiled Baylor's first Cotton Bowl visit ever behind a brilliant day of big plays by freshman Jimmy Cephalo.
The 80s saw the Cotton Bowl perpetuate its tradition of bringing to Dallas the sport's premier players, premier teams, and premier coaches, such as the late Bear Bryant. In 1983, SMU's famed Pony Express backfield of Craig James, Eric Dickerson, and Lance McElhenney rode to glory over a stubborn pit team that was led by renowned quarterback Dan Marino. The triumph put the Mustangs in the Cotton Bowl's victory circle for the first time since 1949. This Georgia touchdown in 1984 cost Texas an undefeated season and spoiled a possible national championship for the second-ranked Horns. College football's miracle man, Doug Flutie, brought his offensive fireworks to Dallas in 1985, and Boston College exploded for 45 points in a shootout with Houston. Yes, for 49 wild, wonderful years, championships have been won and lost here. All Americans and major award winners have displayed their magnificent talents. And the electricity, passion, and golden moments of the Cotton Bowl Classic have been unparalleled in college football. The nation awaited the Classics 50th anniversary game. His name is Vincent Bo Jackson. He is another in the long, distinguished line of brilliant stars to shine in Dallas on New Year's Day. He is also the very heartbeat of the Auburn offense, the most feared combination of speed and power to hit college football in many years. With 21 career games over 100 yards, Jackson's running concerned Jackie Sherrill. Said the A&M coach, we'll try to slow him down. Nobody stops Bo Jackson. To accomplish his mission, Sherrill would unleash a relentless and determined Aggie defense, the pride of the Southwest Conference. The 1986 Cotton Bowl Classic would be a game of contrasts. Both teams had proved to be awesome on the ground, and both could score big numbers. The question would be, which defense would ride herd on its opponent, control the tempo, and thus shape the outcome of the game? While these two teams were playing each other for only the second time in history, the coaches were not strangers. A&M's Jackie Sherrill had played for Pat Dye when Dye was a linebacker coach at Alabama. Before Dye's Tigers and Sherrill's Aggies met on the field, Cotton Bowl officials and their special guests welcomed in the new year with an elegant and spectacular ball. The highlight was the crowning of the Cotton Bowl Queen, Miss Donna Banfield of Texas A&M University. <laughs> On January 1st, 
downtown Dallas became host for the nationally acclaimed Cotton Bowl Parade, celebrating both the Texas sesquicentennial and the 50th year of the Cotton Bowl Classic. The Golden Anniversary Cotton Bowl Classic was about to begin. The Texas State flag arrived by air, and a national CBS television audience was welcomed to Dallas and the 50th Annual Cotton Bowl Classic. For Auburn, it was their first opportunity ever to play in this New Year's Day spectacular. And War Eagle's spirit was long and loud. Texas A&M charged into the Cotton Bowl for the first time in 18 years. Revved up by the 12th man towels waved by their fans. In front of an overflow crowd of more than 73,000 in near perfect weather, the game's first break came in the game's first minute. Following an A&M fumble, the War Eagles claimed the football. And as quick as a Pat Washington pass and a pitch to number 34, Auburn had seven points. Number 34, of course, was Bo Jackson, Heisman Trophy winner, college football player of the year, Auburn's all-time leading runner, and target of a group of determined Aggies. In his final collegiate game, Bo Jackson would be a marked man. But Bo could not burn A&M without the ball. And Sherrill devised a plan of possession football that would utilize his quarterback, Kevin Murray, Southwest Conference Offensive Player of the Year, throwing quick, underneath the coverage passes. Auburn's defense was not prepared for these short dump passes, and the area in the middle between the linebackers was frequently open. Filling that gap, tight end Rod Bernstein, who caught nine passes all season, caught six in this game alone. The short passes softened Auburn's defense for the Aggie Army, an inside power running game that has become another weapon in A&M's potent offense. Harry Johnson's brilliant second effort gave A&M its first points and is worth another closer look. A freshman speedster Johnson seemed to glide into a mob of white helmets and, like a bowling ball, bounced off each obstacle that crossed his path. It was a run that not only gave AM momentum, but showed the depth and versatility of the Aggies' attack. 
or in the history of the Southwest Conference, Texas A&M is the only team ever to average both 200 yards per game running and 200 yards per game passing. Trying to impede this Aggie offense was risky business. And with a spiraling, twisting run by Keith Woodside, A&M had stung Auburn with a pair of first period touchdowns. But Pat Dye did not bring his Tigers to Dallas to remain in the shadows of Texas A&M. For this was a team that during the regular season had incredibly outrushed its opponents by nearly 2,000 yards. Success came when they gave Bo Jackson room to roam, and on this simple screen pass, number 34 authored one of the most thrilling pages in 50 years of cotton ball excitement. Seventy-three yards and a cloud of dazed Aggies later, Bo Jackson had shown why he is considered among the best ever to play the game. The Tigers had turned Jackson's long-distance spectacle into a 13-12 lead. The advantage was short-lived, as a Scott Slater field goal in the final seconds made the halftime score the Aggies 15, Auburn 13 and climaxed a very close and very exciting 30 minutes of football. <laughs> Halftime was highlighted by two of the most spectacular bands in college football, the Auburn War Eagle Band and the Fighting Texas Aggie Band. Their performances were outstanding. In the second half, following an injury to his starter, Pat Dye inserted Jeff Berger at quarterback. His first pass of the half picked off by A&M's Domingo Bryant. And the hot Aggies, who had won 12 of their last 14 games, wasted little time converting the turnover. conference Anthony Tony's 21-yard cutback just three minutes into the period gave A&M an eight-point advantage. For the next 14 minutes that lead was in serious jeopardy as the Aggies would possess the football a mere 90 seconds. Auburn's Tigers, fueled by the magnificent running of Bo Jackson, mounted three long journeys up and down the field, totally controlling the football. But could they turn those yards into touchdowns? was no, only a Chris Johnson field goal. Jackson would finish the Cotton Bowl Classic with 129 yards on a record 31 attempts. But as the shadows grew deeper, four of those attempts proved a turning point in the game. 
with first and goal at the A&M 6. Jackson found some daylight. Second and goal at the A&M 2. Jackson again, and the Aggies said no. Third and goal, and the runner they call Superman was grounded again. Still at the two, fourth down. Will they give it to Bo one more time? They did, and the Aggie defense played it perfectly. Just as the Aggies had stopped Texas on a goal line stand to win a berth in this game, so they halted Auburn four times inside the six. The War Eagles had driven 72 and 92 yards, had run 30 offensive plays, had dominated the clock, and had only three points to show for their efforts. But Auburn's frustration was not over. Moments later, on a crucial fourth and two, Bo Jackson again ran into a wall of iron-willed Aggies. With only a five-point lead, midway through the final period, A&M turned back to its short passing game for big gainers. Tight end Rod Bernstein became the ninth player in Cotton Bowl history to gain more than 100 yards receiving. And junior Kevin Murray shattered Joe Theismann's passing yardage mark with a record 292 yards. Keith Woodside caught the touchdown that clinched Texas A&M's first Cotton Bowl triumph since 1968. A triumph Jackie Sherrill called the greatest win of my career. After one final Auburn thrust was halted, the Aggies would score again wrapping up a great 10 and 2 season with a high national ranking and a tremendous triumph in this golden anniversary game for texas a m would now reign as proud champions of the 1986 cotton bowl classic they were number one in dallas You're the 